Turn with me in your Bible to the book of Ruth, if you would. You know, the Bible has books named after many people, Joshua, for instance, but there are two books named after ladies, Ruth and Esther. And uh, today we're going to look at the book of Ruth, and we're just going to see it like a movie and just move scene to scene and move right on through that wonderful book and see what God has for us through this book. The praise team and the church were singing about Waymaker, Light in the Darkness. Even when we can't see it, even when we can't feel it, that's the way it was with Naomi and her family and with their daughter-in-law, Ruth. But God was still working. And you may be at a point today where you can't see him working or can't feel him working, but he hasn't stopped. He's still working. And we're going to see that today in the book of Ruth. And would you stand with me for the reading of God's holy word? Now, it's only uh, 86 verses. <laughs> but we're just going to read the first chapter of it, 22, okay? We'll go through the whole thing. But now, when it came about in the days when the judges governed that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the land of Moab with his wife and two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of their two sons, Malon and Kilion, Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. Now they entered the land of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left with her two sons. And they took for themselves Moabite women as wives. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. And they lived there about ten years. Then both Malon and Kilion also died. And the woman was bereft of her two children and her late husband. And she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the land of Moab, for she had heard in the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people in giving them food. So she departed from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you've dealt with the dead and with me. May the Lord grant that you find rest each in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, but we will surely return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return, my daughters. Why should you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? And I'll explain that in just a minute. Return, my daughters, go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I said I have hope, and I should even have a husband tonight and also bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it's harder for me than for you, for the hand of the Lord is gone forth against me. And they lifted their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Then she said, Behold, your sister has gone back to her people and her gods return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. Thus may the Lord do to me, and worse, if anything, but death parts me and you. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she said, No more. But they both went until they came to Bethlehem, and it came about when they had come to Bethlehem, all the city was stirred because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? And she said to them, Do not call me Naomi. Naomi means pleasant. Call me Mara. Mara means bitter. For the Lord Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went out full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has witnessed against me and the Almighty has afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and with her, Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, who returned from the land of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Shall we pray? Teach us then, O Lord, this your holy word, 
this family that went through great tragedy. And many of us here today have gone through tragedy or will go through tragedy. Help us, O Lord, like Naomi, keep her faith in you, keep looking in you, keep understanding that you're at work even when we can't see it, even when we can't feel it, because you're the way maker. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. By the way, let me mention uh, before we get started here, I'm a writer. I write for Mature Living and other magazines. I've got six or eight or ten extra copies, free of charge, um, mostly about the land of Israel, Bethlehem, Capernaum, um, Sea of Galilee, the Jesus boat, etc. And they're right up here free of charge. Help yourself to them. Um, I just want us to go through this scene by scene today. It's such a wonderful book. Now, way back when um, Benjamin Franklin was the ambassador to France, right after the American Revolution, Franklin uh, was well known already because of his discovery of electricity. You remember the kite and the sky and the key and all that. And uh, many of the learned societies in France were having him come speak. Now, Benjamin Franklin wasn't a noted Christian. I mean, he, he believed the Bible, but he, he didn't always live it. But in France, they were in the midst of a revolution or about to have one, and there was great skepticism about anything pertaining to God. And Franklin said when he was invited to one of these learned societies, I'll go if I can share with you a, a book and I, I think maybe it ought to be published. I want to see what you think. And they said, well, sure, come on, read it to us. He went to the society, and he read the book of Ruth word for word. And they said, that's a marvelous book, a pastoral scene, tragedy, and all the good things that happen afterwards. You ought to publish that. And Franklin said, well, it's already been published. They said, really, Where? They said, it's in, it's in that Bible that you scoff at but have never read. The book of Ruth is wonderful literature. You can't find better literature than the book of Ruth. I challenge you to. It has every mark of good literature. It has tragedy, increased tragedy, increased tension, and even more increased tension. It has a, a, a knight coming in almost on a white horse to save the day. It has a damsel in distress who's rescued. It has a great reversal at the end. It's got every mark of good literature, uh, the book of Ruth. So let's, let's just um, go through it scene by scene today, shall we? And the first scene is uh, on the way to Moab. You see, a famine had come in Israel, and so the people there were wondering, well, what are we going to do for food? Elimelech and his wife, Naomi, and their two kids, Malon and Kilion. By the way, the, the, those names mean um, sick and pining away. I don't know. Maybe they had colic till they were 14. I don't know. But, <laughs> but, uh, but, but it, they were sickly kids. And they didn't have enough food. So they decided, well, I, I hear there's some food over in Moab. Let's go over there and get a job for a while. We'll come back. Can't you see them saying, we won't be gone long? And here they are. See Elimelech holding the hands of his two boys. They're teenagers or almost teenagers by then. Malon and Kilion. Here's Ruth standing by the wagon. Maybe one little cow pulling the, everything they owned in a little wagon ox cart headed to Moab. Now Moab, the citizens of Moab were relatives of the Israelites, remember? It was uh, through the incest with Lot, remember back in Genesis, that the Moabites and Ammonites came about. So they were distant relatives of the Israelites, but when Israel tried on the exodus to go through the land of Moab, they prohibited them. And God said, because of that, I'm not going to let a Moabite stand in my temple area for 10 generations. Great punishment. Well, what did the Moabites worship? They worshiped a god named Chemosh. And Chemosh was a god that 
Archaeologists have found statues of him, his big old belly open, open in his belly with his arms outstretched, rolling back. And they've determined by the bones they found nearby that they set fire in the belly of Chemosh and on those arms they laid children to roll in and be sacrificed. Now that was in the days before Roe versus Wade, but even in that day, God was for life. Do I have an amen? amen? And he still is for life. Well, notice something here. Elimelech and Naomi didn't pray about going to Moab. They just heard there was food there and they thought we got to do something and so they left. Scene one closes on the way to Moab. Scene two opens on the way back from Moab. But now it's not Naomi, Elimelech, Malon, and Kilion. Now it's just Naomi and her two daughters-in-law. What happened? What happened there in Moab? Elimelech died, probably came suddenly, like it always seems to do. Even with cancer, isn't it sudden? Comes too quickly for us all. My wife of 45 years found she had cancer, and six weeks later, she was gone. Comes quickly to us, doesn't it? Well, Tragedy had come. But the boys were growing up and the hormones were raging and they got in their cars, I mean their chariots, and they started riding around the streets of Moab and they saw some pretty girls, Orpah and Ruth. And it wasn't long till they were bringing those girls back home and they got married. Ruth probably, I mean, Naomi probably thought, well, life is going to be better now. By the way, this book ought to be called Naomi. Naomi's mentioned 21 times, Ruth only 14 times in it. <laughs> but uh, she probably thought life's going to be better now. But then Malon died and Kilion died. Here Naomi found herself in a foreign land without a husband and without either son. She did probably what any of us would do. She decided, I'm going to go back to the people I know. She headed back home. And standing with her are her two daughters-in-laws, Orpah and Ruth. By the way, somebody mentioned to me that Oprah Winfrey that her mother wanted to name her a biblical name, and she found this name Orpah, but they spelled it wrong on the birth certificate. Is that right or not? I don't know for sure, but that's what I've heard. So here they are on the way back, and Naomi says to the daughters-in-law, go, go back home to your family. Maybe God will give you a husband there. Will I live long enough to have other children and you, will you wait to be married to them? Now, what was she talking about? In the Hebrew world back in that day, they had a process called leveret marriage. And leveret marriage was the process by which if a wife died, I mean, if a husband died and a wife was left without, then, then the brother of the husband would marry her. And it was really a good thing for the wife because she would be taken care of. Otherwise, if in that patriarchal society, she would be left without any means. Or if not the brother, the nearest kinsman would to bear children for the wife. Sounds strange to us, but that's the way they did it back then. So she, did, she said, will I live long enough to have children? Go back. Orpah went back. 
And Ruth said those words you've heard in, in weddings before. Maybe it was in your wedding. Entreat me not to leave you, nor to return from following you. For where you lodge, I will lodge, and, and uh, your people shall be my people, and your God my God, and so on. That's the word she shared, but it wasn't originally at a wedding. It was originally between a mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law. What a wonderful mother-in-law Naomi must have been, despite the tragedy that Ruth still wanted to stay with her. Scene two closes. Scene three opens up. Call it scratching out a living. They came back into Bethlehem, and there was undoubtedly lived in the same house that Elimelech had built years earlier. They had simple homes then, built out of mud and, you know, usually just a big one-room house. When a child married and brought his wife home, they would add another room. And, uh, and that's where they went. Undoubtedly, they had to sweep it out and clean it up. It had been unoccupied probably for 10 or 12 years or more. Clean that room up, clean that house up, but what would they eat? How would they live? It was the beginning of the barley harvest. And the Hebrews had a practice um, of gleaning. That is, they would leave the corners of their field. God told them, leave the corners of your field unharvested. And if you drop grain while you're harvesting, leave it there so that the poor can pick it up. And it would give industry to the poor. Notice it didn't say get it up and cook it and put it in their mouth, but it did say, leave it for them. And it showed them industry to gather the corners of the field. Ruth says to her mother-in-law, I think I'll go out and see if I can glean some in the field. Ruth, uh, Ruth's mom, uh, mother-in-law, Naomi undoubtedly said, now be careful, because it's heard of that uh, some ladies are molested like this. You want to be very careful. Watch where you are. Always stay out in the public. And so she went out to harvest in the fields. It wasn't long till she found herself in a field of a man named Boaz. Boaz. And um, she began harvesting there. And when you see Boaz, the first thing you see from this man that owned this field was nothing but graciousness and kindness. He says to his workers, may God bless you today. He didn't say, appear before them and say, get to work. Am I paying you for nothing? I want you to get this done today. No, he said, may God bless you today. And he says to them, who's that woman over there? They said, well, it's the Moabitess, Ruth, who came home with her with their mother-in-law. He said, oh, I know about her. I've heard. She, she stuck with her mother-in-law and has helped her all through this time. She must be a good person. He said, pull out, some, pull out some extra grain from what you gather and drop it so that she'll have plenty to gather. <laughs> when Ruth went home that day, she had a bushel full. And, and Naomi said, where did you get so much? It was plenty for them for several days. By the way, they ate that um, um, low cholesterol whole grain. You know, they just cooked it up, you know, barley. And uh, where, where'd you get that? Well, it was a field of a man named Boaz. And he seemed to be very kind. He even told me to drink water with his servants. Don't go back to town for the water. She said, oh, he's one of your kinsmen. Stay in that field. And so she did. She stayed there, gleaning day after day. Even ate her lunches with, that, with Boaz and the family. Scene three closes. Scene four opens. Call it True Love Waits. You see, when Boaz saw Ruth, he saw something there. And when Ruth saw Boaz, she saw something too. A gleam in her eye, maybe. Can you remember the first time you met your true love? Sandy and I met when we were back in high school, 55 years ago, this summer. A friend of mine, worked at a 7-Eleven type store. And he said, this, this family's moved in and a girl comes in here every day to get a cola or something. He said, she is good looking. You need to come to work with me and meet her. And so I did. 
I came to work with him and stayed all day till Sandy walked in. We began to talk. It wasn't long till we were dating. It wasn't long till we were going together. That's what folks did back then. We went steady, and that's what we did for two and a half years. Her family moved. We lost touch with each other for 47 years till my wife died. And then God, in his mercy, brought us together again. See, I was going through some old things and and I found pictures of Sandy and me from 47 years prior. <laughs> and she found my high school annuals. My father was under hospice care back in the city where she lived. I said, well, look, why don't I just take you out to lunch? We'll catch up with each other and we'll trade pictures. Wasn't a date. But when we saw each other, it was that, that flame hop back up again just like it was to start with. I had to beat her off of me with a stick, but <laughs> I'm kidding, it was probably the other way around, but <laughs> Boaz and Ruth saw each other and it was that kind of love. And Naomi says to Ruth, she says, go to the threshing floor tonight because they're, they're rejoicing with the great harvest and, and uh, they're, they're drinking, they're eating and, and after a while, Boaz will go to sleep. And she said, just sidle up next to him. He's one of your kinsmen. And so talk about indecent proposal. That's exactly what happened. And Boaz wakes up in the middle of the night and here's a woman laying by him. It's dark. He didn't, he didn't know who it is. Who are you? I'm Ruth. Spread the blanket over us. Mm, that's another way of saying take me as your wife. He said, let's be decent about this thing. There is a kinsman who's a closer relative than I am. He said, I'll give you some grain to go back to your mom and he arranged with the others to not let anybody know she'd been there that night. And uh, he said, I'll, I'll uh, talk to this nearest kinsman, and if he won't take you as a wife, I will. So he met at the city gate. That's where they did all their business. And they met together at the city gate, Boaz did, with some of the elders in the city. And after a while, he had them sitting down as witnesses, and after a while, here comes the nearest kinsman. And he says, sit down here with us, buddy. We want to talk with you a little while. He said, what is it? He said, well, you know, Naomi has come back to town, and she needs to sell her property that Elimelech loaned on so that they can have enough to live on. Do you want to buy her property? Oh, yeah, I'd like to expand my farm. And Boaz on the inside was going, oh, no. But Boaz continued on. He said, now realize as soon as you buy the farm, you've bought the woman that goes with the farm, Ruth. You'll have to be her goel, her kinsman redeemer. And he said, oh, now wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute now, wait a minute. I think that would mess my inheritance up. I've, I've, I refuse my right of redemption. You take her. And Boaz was probably going, well, if you insist. But on the inside, he was going, yeah, yeah. I mean, Boaz was a cool dude, right? He was cool. Cool is Hebrew for you demand, you demand. <laughs> Boaz, he was, he was so happy. And so they marry. Scene four closes. Scene five comes. In title scene five, first comes love, then comes marriage, then comes Ruth with a baby carriage. And when the book closes, here's Naomi with a little baby in her arms, hugging and holding that little baby named Obed. She never thought she'd get to hold a grandchild, but now she is. And there he is. Now, what are some lessons we can learn from the book of Ruth? Just quick, some quick lessons. Lesson number one, 
Life's not like it seems right now. There's more to life than it seems. You may be down right now. Hold on to God. Life's not like it seems. God is still at work. And that leads us right on into the second lesson. Hold on to God even in the hard times. Even in the hard times, hold on to him. I think it was Robert Frost, the poet, who wrote the words, I walked a mile with pleasure. She chattered all the way, but left me none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow, and ne'er a word said she, but oh, the things I learned from her when sorrow walked with me. Hold on to God even in the hard times, even in the sorrowful times. He's got something going on. You don't see it yet, but God is God. We're not God. God is God. Ruth saw something in her mother-in-law because her mother-in-law was faithful to God even in the difficulty. Naomi wasn't a leader in the church, but she was a winsome soul for the Lord, for the Lord God. And her daughter-in-law, Ruth, followed along because of that. You and I can do likewise. Hold on to God even in the hard times. Uh, now, this is not one of the lessons that I have listed up here, but it is true. Be sympathetic of others when they're going through hard times. Boaz was, we can be too. When we've been through some difficulties, we know how to compensate for, to commiserate with, to empathize with those who are going through hard times as well. Well, lesson number three is the lesson of the kinsman redeemer. It's called Goel in, in the Hebrew. And uh, Goel is a kinsman redeemer. It's that one that redeems or buys back the wife in order that they may have kids for the deceased. Strange concept for us, but it was, it was really a benefit for the ladies. Boaz is the kinsman redeemer in the Old Testament. Jesus is your kinsman redeemer in our time. See, when sin had its way in our lives and we were destined for a sinner's hell, Jesus stretched out his arms on the cross and said, I'll buy you back. I'll pay for those sins. You won't have to pay for them. Just receive me, accept me, live for me. And you'll find that your debt is paid in full. Kinsman Redeemer. And then the last lesson that I have here. Serve God till life is over. <laughs> Naomi must have been tempted to give up years before. I'll just live out my days here in Moab. It'll all be over. No. Keep serving God. Your best days may be your last days in the Lord. God may have saved his very best for you to your last days. Keep serving him. He's got something good for you. Good in the days ahead. Jeremiah said, I know the plans I have for you, plans for a future and a hope, not to destroy you, but to build you up. God's got good for you. That baby, Obed, Obed grew up and had kids of his own. I wonder if Naomi lived long enough to rock her grandchildren in that rocker on that front porch that Elimelech built. Her great-grandchildren, Obed, Jesse. And then Jesse, yeah, he had some children too. And among them, seven sons. And the youngest of those sons was a shepherd boy named David. David became the greatest king Israel has ever known. 
And out of his lineage, there grew up a man named Joseph a thousand years later. Joseph was required to go back to his hometown to pay his taxes. So he took his espoused wife, Mary, with him. And there in that same city where Ruth and Naomi lived, where Boaz lived, there were some shepherds out in the field. Maybe it was the same field Boaz had where Ruth had gleaned. And they saw some angels saying, Rejoice, peace on earth. The Savior's been born. And there in Bethlehem, in the lineage of David, in the lineage of Ruth, the Moabitess, was born Jesus, our Redeemer. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.